Welcome to another episode of Today in Radio History. Today we spotlight an episode from The Avenger, which was originally broadcast today, June 8th, 1945. Like and subscribe to us below and click that bell to receive notifications on our new video uploads. Radio historian John Dunning described the season of The Avenger as a poor man's version of The Shadow. Jim Brandon, alter ego of The Avenger, was a biochemist who invented a telepathic indicator and a secret diffusion capsule, both of which helped him fight crime. Having a drop-dead gorgeous subordinate, Fern Collier, who alone knew his true identity, he had the ability of being hidden by a black light of invisibility and was able to interpret thought flashes of other people. You can get a preloaded, nostalgic-looking retro MP3 player with hundreds of series to choose from by clicking on the link below in the description or visiting us online at radiolongago.com. Today's episode, High Tide Murder, originally aired on this date, June 8th, 1945. Today in Radio History presents The Avenger. Avenger. The road to crime ends in a trap that justice sets. Crime does not pay. The Avenger, sworn enemy of evil, is actually Jim Brandon, a famous biochemist. Through his numerous scientific experiments, Brandon has perfected two inventions to aid him in his crusade against crime as the Avenger the telepathic indicator by which he is able to pick up thought flashes, and the secret diffusion capsule, which cloaks him in the black light of invisibility. Brandon's assistant, the beautiful Fern Collier, is the only one who shares his secrets and knows that he is the man the underworld fears as the Avenger. And now... The Avenger and the High Tide Murders. You, Sandro. Yes, Grunny, it's me. Are we expecting the cops? No, no. Come on in. Mighty glad you came, Sandro. Did you follow my instructions? Sure, nobody knows I'm here. You don't think I'm fool enough to let anybody know I'm mixed up with you, do you? Now, now, Sandro, there's no cause for you. Shut up, Scrawny. Gun. What are you pulling a gun on me for, Sandro? Because I, I don't trust you, Scrawny. Not even when I can see you. Well, I've always been fair to you, Sandro. I always... Shut up, I told you. I'll do the talking this time. You're a double-crosser, Scorny. The worst kind. You get a guy in deep with you, and then you double-cross him, cheat him. I haven't cheated you, Sandro. Honest, I I'm not giving you the chance to double-cross me, Scorny. I come for my share of that last shipment you got. And I'm not leaving without it. Sure, Sandro. In fact, I want more than my share, since you're holding out on the other boys. Sure, sure, Sandro. That's why I sent for you. To give you your share. We'll be partners, Sandro, you and me. Never mind that. Where's the stuff? Right over there in that box. I'll get it. There we you. are. I'll get it myself. If you make a move, Scrawny, I'll plug you. All right, all right. Help yourself, then. <laughs> Goodbye, Sandro. The tide is going out, and you go with it. Just like the others, out with the tide. You were smarter than the rest of them, Sandro. Only you didn't know about this trap door, did you? Nobody but Scrawny knows about that. Ah. Just one more victim, and all the money will be mine. One more victim. I must prepare the trap for him. <laughs> I 
I'm hungry. I'm hungry. I want to stop working now and go to dinner. It's all right, Fern. It's all right. We'll take time out now for dinner. I've been waiting for you to say that. I know you have. The telepathic indicator caught your thought flashes. I didn't realize how late it was. That indicator is working so well lately, I've, I've absolutely no privacy. Yes, we're getting wonderful results, Fern. Of course, a lot of the flashes I pick up are unimportant, but do you realize that our experiments in thought projection and transmission have gone far beyond those of Edison and Creel? Oh, I know, Jim. Jim. Yes, Fern. Jim, let me try the diffusion capsule. I've been reading up on all those experiments you made with black light, and I... Fern, you must put that idea out of your mind. I told you before that it would be impossible. It's a very dangerous process. Oh, I know it's terribly dangerous, Jim, but I'm not afraid. No. And that's final, young lady. Why, the diffusion capsule knocked me for a loop every time I tried it for three years. Until finally I was able to hit just exactly the right formula. Oh, but, Jim, now that you have the right formula... Fern, you don't understand. That formula will only work on the individual who tested it every step of the way on himself. But, Jim, think how much more valuable I'd be as your assistant if I could become invisible as you do. Perhaps. But it isn't possible, Fern. Why? Let me explain. The diffusion capsule is a combination of two experiments, two processes. First, it's a question of harnessing the light rays that are normally invisible to the human eye and concentrating them in tiny capsules to be released at will. After I'd spent years perfecting that formula, I had to set about finding a serum that I could inject into my system that would affect the pigment cells in such a way that when these concentrated rays were released around me, they dissolve both color and dimension and render me invisible. Then it's the injections that are so dangerous. Yes. For one whole year, I was able to stand them only in very small doses. And then gradually, after several years, my system absorbed enough of the serum to camouflage me completely when the concentrated light rays fell upon me. But if I hadn't been in exceptional physical condition, Fern, the whole experiment would have been hopeless. Well, perhaps you're right, Jim. And but besides, I... you're much too attractive to want to become invisible, even for short intervals. <laughs> oh, Fern, now you do understand, don't you? Of course, Jim. Let's forget it. I couldn't manage without you, you know that. Why, you've come every step of the way with me on the telepathic indicator. I simply couldn't have perfected it without you. Thanks, Jim. Now, if you'll put those test tubes away, I'll turn off the indicator and we'll go out for something to eat. Right. Fern. What is it, Jim? A man's just been killed. Jim, the indicator? Yes. I caught a distinct telepathic message. Well, how can you be sure someone was killed? Because the message came in so strong. It's been proved through thousands of experiments that 85% of all psychic impressions received are relayed by those who are suffering violence. What was the message, Jim? It's strange. I've had three messages like this in the last two weeks, all on the same thought wavelength. Only this last one was stronger than the other two. The sounds were all the same, though. What kind of sounds, Jim? Lapping water and wind, mostly. And then the sudden sound of a heavy door opening and a splash. Do you mean like someone falling in the water? Yes. Only this time I also received the impression of a man's voice. A man's voice screaming out a name. What name, Jim? Something that sounded like, uh, like scrawny. Scrawny? What do you suppose that could mean? I don't know yet. Oh, will you answer the phone, Fern? Yeah. I don't want to leave the indicator. Maybe I'll pick up something else. Hello? Yes, he's here, Inspector White. Yes? Where? At the Cragmore Dock. Oh, yes, I'm sure he will. I'll tell him. Thank you, Inspector. That was Inspector White, Jim. What did he want? The body of a man's been washed ashore at Cragmore. What? He wants you to come down and make some special tests. The inspector thinks it's murder. That you, Brandon? Hey, yes, Inspector. Coming, Fern? No, I'll wait here at the car, Jim. All right. Well, Inspector, find any clues? Very few. The doc says the body's been in the water about two weeks. I want you to check on that. No identification. Not a thing. Oh, flash that light over here, Joe. Well, what do you think, Jim? At first glance, I'd say two weeks is about right. We can't tell much from his clothes. There was no jewelry, which might mean the motive was robbery. Yeah, it might. Find anything at all in his pockets? No. Only a little piece of broken glass. You mind letting me see it? Here. Why, this is a piece of a jeweler's loop. 
A very good one, too. This man must be a stranger around here. He doesn't fit any of our descriptions for missing persons. Inspector, uh, do you think you could keep this out of the papers for a few days? No, I can't keep it out of the papers, Brandon. And I don't see why I should try. Well, you're in the driver's seat, of course, Inspector. But if I had a day or two, well, I think... Well, Brandon, I... all I want from you in this case is a complete chemical analysis report. The same kind of checkup you did in the Reardon case. Okay. I'll come to headquarters later. But you shouldn't let my simple inquiries affect your blood pressure like that, Inspector. Well, every time you see a body, you pop up with a lot of unconventional theories. Well, murder is hardly ever conventional, Inspector. No monkey business on this case, Brandon. That chemical report is all I want from you. You'll get it. In the meantime, I'll have an impression made of his teeth and go over every inch of his clothes. Right. I think we'll have to work fast on this, Inspector. We? All right. All right, you. I'll see you later. So long. Remember what I said, Jim. What's the matter, Jim? The inspector sounds mad. Oh, just the usual routine. He's afraid I'll steal his thunder. Well, were you able to find out anything? I think so, Fern. I'd be willing to bet anything it was that man's dying message I picked up about two weeks ago. Do the police have any idea who he was? Not yet, but I'm pretty certain he was a jeweler. If he was, then the other two thought impressions I received may have been from jewelers, too. If your hunch is right, Jim, three jewelers would be missing in the city right now. Right. Let's get back into town and start investigating. Tonight? Oh. Well, I guess it is pretty late, isn't it? And I'm still hungry. Remember, we never did get our dinner. Okay. But first thing in the morning, Fern, we're going calling. The pawn shops first. <laughs> Jim? About ten minutes. Uh, sit down, Fern. Thanks. Oh, golly, I didn't know there were so many jewelry stores in the whole world. I'm tuckered out. And hungry, no doubt. Mm -hmm. uh, I ordered for you. Oh, waiter. Oh, waiter, you can bring our food now. Right away, sir. Well, how did you make out with your list, Fern? Well, out of all the shops I covered, there was only one owner missing. He's been out of town for a week. Did you get his name? Yes, it's, um... Don't tell me. Let's see if I can guess. Was it Artemis? Yes. How did you know? I'll tell you later. Uh, I want to give you my report first. Oh, I'm trying to be patient, but my curiosity is killing me. Well, uh, first I found out that a pawnbroker by the name of Blake has been out of town for two weeks. Jim, do you think he could be the one whose body was washed ashore last night? I think there's a very good chance that was Blake. I called Inspector White, and he's going to check him. But what about the third? You said there'd be three missing. Yes, and there are. A third jeweler by the name of Fenro left town on business yesterday morning. Jim, how can we be certain these are the three men we're looking for? Well, after I checked all the stores on my list, I happened to remember an article that appeared in the newspapers about six months ago concerning a corner in the diamond market. At that time, an investigation had been demanded by the Municipal Jewelers Association, who were outraged at the possibility of any shady dealings within their trade. I went to the library and checked back on that article. And found the names of our suspects? No, I got those through a muckraking reporter I know. He tipped me off that Fenro, Blake, Artemis, and a man by the name of Vickers were thoroughly investigated at that time because they were suspected of selling odd pieces of jewelry at unusually low prices. How were they able to do that? Well, my guess is that the jewels were smuggled and they were fencing them. Oh, but wouldn't the police know that? That would be pretty hard to check, Fern, especially if the goods came from Europe. All right, Jim, suppose all your suspicions turn out to be fact. There's still one other thing. If three jewelers are missing, why haven't their families reported it to the police? Because they're not considered missing. To all intents and purposes, they're just away on business. Oh, I see. Well, what do we do now? We start searching for the missing piece in the puzzle. The missing piece? Yes. The fourth jeweler by the name of Vickers. We've got to find out whether he's also known as Scrawny. For if he isn't, he's next on the list for murder.
that shop belonged to Vickers. I was in there this morning. I know. That's why I think it would be better for me to go in alone this time. Uh, wait for me just beyond the shop there, Fern. All right, but don't be wrong. I'm nervous. What can I do for you, sir? Uh, do you mind if I look around a little? Yes, I do mind. What do you want? I'm looking for the Berkeley necklace. What? Right. I thought you might have it. I tried all your partners' places, but they didn't seem... What to... are you talking about? I have no partners. No? I understood Artemis, Blake, and Fenro. Get out of here. That's no way to treat a customer, Mr. Vickers. Get out, I say, or I'll call the police. I don't think you will. Get out! Put that gun away, Vickers. You're in enough trouble already. I'll give you exactly five seconds to blow. All right. You win. Jim. I think he's our man, Fern. He pulled a gun on me. But we've got to get some evidence. Well, how? You go into the store and pretend you want to buy something. Huh? Keep him occupied for a few minutes. Oh, I'll do my best. What do you plan to do, Jim? Examine his safe. It must be in the back room. It's not in the store. Jim? Yes, Fern. It's time for the Avenger to take over. I thought I told you to get out. Where, where did he go? Where did who go? That man with you. There's no one with me. I was sure I saw him come in the door and then... And he disappeared. Well, there's no one here. Maybe the sunlight blinded you for a moment as I opened the I door. I don't know. I was sure. I must be seeing things. I came in to look at that gold pin you have in the window. The one with the topaz in the center. Would you show it to me, please? Yes, I'll get it. The one on the right. That, that's it. Oh, my, it's lovely. How much is it? Forty dollars. Forty? Oh, I'm afraid that's too expensive. Well, I have a smaller one. It's in the back room. I'll oh, get no. it. Oh, no. No, never mind. This is the exact size I'm looking for. Perhaps I... All right, Fern. I finished. Come right. on. What did you say? Oh, the pin. Well, I hadn't planned on anything so expensive. Busy, Vickers? You. What are you doing here? Stow that, Vickers. I've got business with you. Get rid of that kind of... Sorry, I can't take the pin. Thanks for your trouble. Did you find anything, Jim? Plenty. Who was that man who came out of the back room? What man? There was no one back there. Well, the man came through the back way shortly after you did. Vickers was terrified of him. Fern, we've got to go back there. Vickers may be in danger of his life. Come on. Oh, that door's locked. Stand back, Fern. Yeah. I'll have to break it down. No. Oh. Jim, look, on the floor. It's Vickers. Vickers. Vickers, quick. Who did it? Who stabbed you, Vickers? Scrawny. What part of the beach does this road lead to, Jim? A place called Peabody's Cove. Never heard of it. Who's Peabody? Captain Peabody is an old sailor. His family has owned this stretch of beach for generations. The captain makes his living renting fishing dories. But why are we going to see him? Well, Captain Peabody knows everyone along the coast for miles. Mm -hmm. I want to try to get a line on that man you saw in Vickers' pawn shop. Oh? You said he gave you the impression of being a seafaring man? Well, it was only a vague impression, Jim. Yeah. His face was weather-beaten, and he used the term stow that. Not much to go on, really. Yeah, and there was one other thing. Vickers was killed with a knife. A fisherman's knife. Ah, there, there's Peabody's place now. Look at all those boats. Aren't they beautiful? All right, come on, Fern. Now, oh, there's Peabody on the dock. Hello there, Captain. Uh, hello. Well, if it isn't Jim Brandon. How be you, Jim? I'm fine, Captain. This is my assistant, Fern Collier. Hello, Captain. Pleased to meet you, Miss. Well, Captain, what's your theory about those two bodies that were washed up on the coast? Say, that's something, ain't it? Two of them within a week. I noticed by the papers that you were helping on the case. That's right. Uh, Captain, does the name Scrawny mean anything to you? Scrawny? Yeah. Nope, never heard that name. Has yeah, it got something to do with the case? Maybe. But all we're certain of in this case is how long the bodies were in the water. And what you want to know is where they come from, eh? That's what I'm working on, Captain. Well, son, you ought to be able to figure that out pretty accurate, according to the tides. How do you mean? Now you take a look at this here map, Jim. Yeah? Huh? You know what it is? Oh, it's a tide chart, isn't it? Right. You notice how the currents hereabouts surge into narrow channels? Yeah. 
Well, those channels along this stretch of coast are as accurate and permanent as a, a paved road on, on dry land. You mean that if you know exactly where something landed on the shore and how long it was in the water, mm -hmm. you can figure where it started from according to the channels? Yep. Why, when I was a little shaver, me and my brother used to send messages and bottles through these channels to kids ten miles down the coast. Captain, you've hit on something. Uh, I'd like to try a little experiment, if, if you'll help me. Why, sure, Jim. Well, rig up your best dory and bring along those tide charts. You and I are going on a little boat ride. Right away, Jim. I'll have everything set in five minutes. Do I come too, Jim? No, you'd better stay here, Fern. How long do you think you'll be gone? An hour or two. Oh, well, I'll take a little drive up the coast to kill time. Okay, but be careful. Good luck, Jim. You ready, Jim? Yeah, I'm coming, Captain. I'll see you later, Fern. Right. Don't drive too fast. I won't. Bye. That's a gun in your back, lady. Who are you? Start driving, north. No, I won't, I... Start driving, I said. Or I'll let you have it. What, you... You're the man I saw in Vickers' shop. You murdered Vickers. You Vickers. know too much for your own good. Drive faster, don't you? You're scrawny. That's right. But you're the only living person who knows it. And you ain't going to be living long. Drive faster, I said. Oh. Faster. <laughs> longer to wait now. If you're going to kill me, why don't you do it and get it over with? Why do you keep me tied up here? We have to wait for the tide. The tide? What does that to do with it? Everything. Out with the tide. That's the way it must be. You mean I'm going to be drowned? Of course. I thought you knew that. You seem to know so much. I'm not the only one who knows that. The sound. Someone else knows about the lapping of the water, that creaking door, the spring of a trap door, that No flash. one could know of them but you. Everyone else who ever came here is dead. You... Police will find you out there. That's enough of that. I know you're bluffing. How much longer do you want? Half an hour yet. Exactly half an hour. <laughs> It's almost time. I'm checking everything so you won't be in, in any trouble. You won't get away with it. You won't. Who's to stop me? Look. As you drop through this trap door, this bag of salt will hook onto you and weigh you down. Then the tide carries your body out to sea. And later when you're found, <laughs> you'll be many miles from here. Oh, you're mad. I believe you killed for the sheer joy No, of no, I, I killed for gold. For gold and jewels. <laughs> but now I, I must untie. Another minute. The tide goes out ready. You must be ready now. Hold your wrist still. Oh, Jim, Jim I'm afraid. There now, stand up. <laughs> what was that noise? Who's there? Here I am, scrawny. It's the Avenger. Oh, thank heaven. The Avenger? Where? Where are you? I can't see you, Avenger. No, you can't see me, Scrooby. No one can see me, but I'm here. Where? Where are you? Over here, behind these salt bags. I'll get you. I'll shoot you. Not there. Over here in the corner. Uh, I'll find you. Uh, I'll kill you. Oh. Are you all right, Fern? Yes. Wait for me in the car outside, Fern. Oh. I'll just have a look around here. The police will want some evidence. Well, this place is certainly reeking with it. Don't be long, Jim. <laughs> report, Inspector, to save time. Yes, I guess that just about cleans up the case. Oh, uh, by the way, Inspector, congratulations. That was a good picture of you in this morning's Herald. 
Oh, now, now, don't get mad, Inspector. No offense, no offense. Okay. <laughs> okay. See you on the next case. Goodbye. Well, Jim, was Inspector White completely satisfied? He wouldn't admit it, Fern, but he was. The police boat just picked up Scrawny's body in the exact place I pointed out on the tie chart. Oh, by the way, Scrawny's real name was Joplin. Scrawny was the code name the smugglers and fences used for him. Mm, I still don't understand how you knew exactly where they'd find him. Look, it's all here on these channel maps Captain Peabody gave me. Mm, let me see. Yeah. Now, here's the way the smugglers worked. Uh, sailors dumped the smuggled cargo overboard right here at the beginning of this narrow channel, just as the tide was going in. Uh, the channel ends here, under this long pier old Scrawny had built along the coast. He had nets stretched along the entire length of the channel under the pier. And when the tide came in, they caught the cargo. Then old Scrawny, all he had to do was haul in the nets and distribute the cargo among his fences. Just as simple as that. Oh, but then why should Scrawny want to kill the men who fenced the jewels for him? He didn't, as long as the smuggled cargo was jewels. But the last two shipments were currency. Enormous sums of it in sealed waterproof bags. Oh, so he didn't need the fences. Yeah, that's right, Fern. But evidently, the fences demanded their share of the shipment, so Scrawny decided to get rid of them. He sent for each one separately on the pretext of sharing the loot with him. Vickers was the only one who wouldn't go, so Scrawny had to come to him. Each of the others, well, you saw the little trap he set for them. Yes, I saw it, but I was too frightened to understand how it worked. Well, those salt bags were rigged up to hook onto the victim automatically as he fell through the trap door. This was always done just as the tide was going out, so the victim was immediately carried out to sea. But where did the salt go? After a time, it dissolved in the water and the bags fell apart because they were made of semi-perishable cloth. Oh, it's horrible. And to think that I... Now, you mustn't think about it anymore, Fern. The case is closed. But you can thank Captain Peabody for showing me the beginning of that narrow channel that led me to old Scrawny's place in time to save you. Oh, I'm going to buy Captain Peabody a nice present. Oh, he'd like that. He said you were right pretty. Oh, you. You know, the minute I got to Scrawny's place, I knew the trail was ended. How, oh, Jim? I recognized the sounds. They were exactly like the impressions I received on the telepathic indicator. Oh, I'm glad it's over. And so am I, Fern. Well, what about some dinner? Oh, fine. Only let's not have tea all characters, names, places, and plots used in the Avenger program are fictitious. Any similarity to persons living or dead is purely coincidental. This is a thought. A thought. A thought. Remember, listen for another adventure of... The Avenger... Thank <laughs> you.